In this video, I want to talk about the intuition behind Bayesian inference. So on the top left here, I've just written out Bayes' rule, and we see that the denominator term here doesn't contain any theta dependence. And because of that, the entirety of the shape of the posterior is determined by the numerator of Bayes' rule. So that's the likelihood p of x given theta times p of theta, the prior. And we see here that this is a kind of weighted geometric average here. And because of the geometric nature of the average, geometric here just meaning that I'm multiplying the things together, that means that it is sensitive to small values of either of these two quantities. So we see that the posterior is a kind of weighted average of the likelihood and the prior. So what does that mean? Well, it means that in general, the posterior peak, the peak value of the posterior, and in general, the posterior probability mass is somewhere between the location of the likelihood peak, in other words, the kind of maximum likelihood estimator, and the peak of the prior. And that makes sense intuitively because we expect the posterior to be a weighted average of our prior experimental beliefs and that which is dictated by our data, which is determined by the likelihood. We can also glean another thing from this formula, which is what happens as the amount of data that we collect increases. So as the amount of data that we collect increases, then crucially, the likelihood L of x given theta decreases. Not only does the likelihood decrease in value, it also becomes more narrow. And because it is becoming narrower, the posterior peak is then being dictated a lot more by the peak of the likelihood, because any values of theta away from the maximum likelihood estimator, or a long way away from the maximum likelihood estimator, have very, very low likelihoods. And hence, the posterior probability density there is very, very low. So as the amount of data we collect increases and our likelihood becomes narrower, we find that the posterior peak becomes closer and closer to the peak of the likelihood. And it becomes, if the prior is a long way away from that, it becomes further and further away from the prior. Also, the posterior peak becomes narrower because the likelihood is becoming narrower. I'm going to now use an example and some simulations in Mathematica to illustrate how these two processes work that I've described thus far. So the example I'm going to talk about is imagining we have a random sample of 10 children who are aged 6, and in that sample of 10 children, we count the number of children who can read. In order to come up with a likelihood which is appropriate to this situation, we need to make some assumptions. So some of these assumptions are, are pretty much not assumptions, they're just statements of fact. The first one being that the outcome here, x, is a discrete random variable. It can only take on the values 0, 1, 2, etc. up to 10. The second assumption is that we have a fixed sample size. And because here we're assuming that we've only got a sample of 10 children, that is trivially satisfied. So these first two things here really aren't assumptions, they're just facts about the situation. The next two are assumptions, however. So the next assumption is that the literacy result of one child is independent of that of the next child. So what does that mean? Well, to give you an example of how this would be violated, imagine that we took two children who are both aged six from the same family. Likely, the literacy of one child tells you quite a lot about the literacy of the other child because their family would have likely brought them up in a similar sort of way, which would mean that perhaps their literacies are pretty similar. However, if my sample comprises children from different families, let's say in different parts of the town, then perhaps the assumption of them being independent or the literacy rates being independent would be relatively okay. The final assumption that we make here is that the children are drawn from the same overall population. And what does that mean? It means that we can treat our data as being identically distributed. In other words, there is this sort of same underlying rate of literacy from the populations from which each of the children are being drawn. 
If we look up all of these assumptions, we see that the distribution which satisfies them is the binomial distribution. And the binomial distribution, if you don't know it, is really a sum of Bernoulli random variables. And a Bernoulli distribution can be used to represent the outcome of testing one individual child's literacy. Now I want to illustrate the intuition behind the Bayesian inference process for this particular example. So here, what I'm showing in the top panel is the prior that I'm using, which we're starting off by assuming is flat between zero and 100% literacy. In the next panel, what we have is we have the likelihood, and we're assuming in this first example that we obtained a sample where two children out of the 10 were literate. Finally, the bottom panel shows the shape of the posterior that we obtain here. And we can see that when I'm assuming a uniform prior between zero and 100% literacy, the shape of the posterior is solely dictated by the shape of the likelihood, because there is no shape here conveyed in the prior. However, we can see as I change my prior here that the posterior shifts over, it shifts rightwards. And we see that the shape of the posterior is such that the posterior peak lies somewhere between the peak of the prior and the likelihood. And so we can see here when we're using a fairly strong prior that most of the children should be literate, we obtain a posterior that's somewhere near 50%, which is halfway between the peak of the likelihood and the peak of the prior. Now I'm going to do the opposite of what I just did. I'm going to hold the prior constant and I'm going to vary the number of children that we find in our data sample that we find to be literate. So we're starting off here with finding zero children out of 10 who are literate. And then as I increase the number of children who I find are literate in my sample, we see that the likelihood shifts over, and so the maximum likelihood estimator also shifts over, and also the posterior shifts in accordance with the likelihood. And what we see again is that here the posterior peak ends up being somewhere between the peak of the prior and that of the likelihood. Now I'm going to keep the prior constant and the fraction of children I find in my sample that are literate. So here I'm going to keep that fraction fixed at 20%. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the sample size. So what we see here when we have a sample size of 10 is that the position of the posterior is roughly halfway between that of the likelihood and the prior. But as I increase my sample size, the posterior peak shifts over to the left and it becomes ever closer to the position of the peak of the likelihood. And also we notice that the posterior peak also becomes narrower in accordance with that of the likelihood. And so we can see that as we increase my sample size here, that the posterior becomes narrower and it more and more reflects the weight of the data. Our prior prejudices just have less and less effect. And that's exactly what we would want to happen. As we collect more data, we would want to give more and more weight to the data.